Hi friends, my name is Benjamin. In the peaceful town of Arklow, Ireland, on a Saturday evening in December 2019, a horrific event occurred that left the community in shock. Nadine Lott, a young beautician and mother, was the victim of a brutal attack that changed everything. And today I will tell you the details about that night, about her relationship, the shocking sequence of events, and the legal consequences that followed. Nadine Lott was born on October 6, 1989, to Claire and David Lott in Arklow, Ireland. She was the eldest of three children. She always tried to take care of her family and help her parents. On the 14th of December, 2019, a Saturday at approximately 4.25 a.m., Amela Kalenovich contacted the police reporting an urgent situation involving her neighbor, Nadine Lott, who had been stabbed. Upon arriving at the apartment of Nadine Lott, a 30-year-old beauty therapist in Arklow, Wicklow, Ireland, the police found Nadine lying unconscious on the kitchen floor with severe injuries. Claire Lott, Nadine's mother, was attempting to assist her daughter. The police promptly called for an ambulance, describing Nadine's condition as if she had been beaten to a pulp. Amela Kulenovich informed the police that she had rushed to Nadine's apartment upon hearing screams. Upon entering, she witnessed Nadine's ex-partner, Daniel Murtaugh, hunched over her and delivering violent blows while emitting growling noises. Amila described Murtaugh as being consumed by rage, resembling a wild animal. She promptly alerted the police and also contacted Nadine's sister, Phoebe Lott, who, along with her mother Claire, arrived at the scene within minutes. Upon the police's arrival at Nadine's apartment, Daniel was not present. Investigations revealed that Daniel and Nadine first crossed paths in 2012 while both were employed in Darwin, Australia. Nadine worked there as a beauty therapist in a beauty salon and enjoyed it, but moved back to Ireland after a year. Daniel also moved home a few months after Nadine. Initially, the couple intended to make their relationship endure, considering plans to live together. However, the relationship ultimately faltered. Subsequently, Nadine relocated to an apartment in Arklow with their daughter Kaya, while Daniel took up residence with his parents in Dublin. On the night of the 13th of December, police discovered that Daniel had traveled to Arklow and spent the night in Nadine's apartment while she was out celebrating her aunt's birthday. What happened when Nadine arrived home? The following morning, when paramedics arrived, Nadine was promptly taken to the hospital, and a few hours later, Daniel was arrested. At 7.30 a.m., Daniel collided with a tree while driving his Volvo car, resulting in the vehicle ending up in a ditch in Lara. A passerby noticed the car in the ditch while crossing Bookie's Bridge in Lara and observed Daniel standing at the roadside. Concerned, passerby stopped to offer assistance. In a shocking admission, Daniel informed him that he had... I killed my wife because she was with my friend. Daniel was subsequently transported to the police station for questioning, and as the interview progressed, some harrowing details of the violence inflicted on Nadine began to surface. When initially questioned by the police about Nadine's condition, Daniel claimed to have no recollection due to being intoxicated. He first asserted that he had given her a slap after a confrontation sparked by his drinking and smoking in her apartment. However, under further scrutiny, he eventually admitted to delivering five or six forceful slaps, acknowledging that some were applied with significant force. Aware that the severity of Nadine's injuries could not be attributed solely to a few slaps, the police persisted in their questioning. Daniel, a trained boxer, then confessed to pounding and punching like mad at Nadine. He elaborated, stating, I knew she was with a lad in Arklo, and I was just trying to get it out of her. When asked about the apparent lack of damage to his hands, Daniel explained that his knuckles were conditioned from years of boxing. Despite expressing shock and fear at the sight of blood coming from Nadine's nose and lips, he asserted that she was still alive when he left the apartment. 
Nadine sustained a stab wound to the right side of her neck, and when questioned about a knife discovered near her, Daniel asserted that it was merely a butter knife he had used the previous night to cut up a burger and a battered sausage. When asked about the location of the assault, Daniel stated that it all transpired in the living room. However, when the police pointed out that Nadine was found in the kitchen, he suggested that she must have walked into the kitchen on her own after he left and perhaps collapsed there. The police countered by informing Daniel of apparent drag marks leading into the kitchen. Despite this evidence, Daniel maintained his stance that he had only assaulted Nadine in the living room, contradicting the physical indications at the scene. Police asked him what he used to attack Nadine with, and he initially said just his fists. Daniel then told police that he had a tire pump charger and the wire wrapped around his knuckles as he beat her. Daniel also accepted he may have used a cigarette charger in a hammer-type motion. He denied using the mirror that was found in Nadine's apartment. When police entered the apartment, there was broken glass in the living room and leading down the hallway and in the kitchen. Part of the frame from the mirror was found in the kitchen. In his final interview with the police, Daniel recounted waking up on the sofa to the sound of Nadine shouting and screaming. I gave her a slap, and she went back and onto the ground beside the cabinet. Standing over her, he began pounding her, only realizing the severity of the situation when he saw the blood. Daniel claimed he never intended to harm Nadine, professing his love for her and asserting that the feeling was mutual. He insisted to the police that, had he wanted to kill Nadine, she would be gone. Tragically, three days after the assault, Nadine succumbed to her severe injuries, never regaining consciousness, and passed away in the hospital. Subsequently, Daniel faced murder charges. Daniel entered a plea of not guilty to murder, but admitted guilt to manslaughter. While acknowledging that he was solely responsible for causing Nadine's death, he contended that he lacked the requisite intent to be charged with murder. Daniel argued that the influence of illegal substances and alcohol on the night in question played a pivotal role in the tragic assault on Nadine. The central question for the jury was to determine whether Daniel had the intention to kill or cause serious harm to Nadine. In a series of admissions of fact at the start of the trial, Daniel's attorney conceded that he had unlawfully taken Nadine's life, admitting, he alone inflicted the injuries she suffered. The judge instructed the jury that murder constitutes a crime of specific intent, occurring when one person unlawfully kills another with the intention of causing death or serious injury. Despite Daniel admitting guilt to manslaughter, indicating he accepted responsibility for unlawfully causing Nadine's death, he contended that he lacked the requisite mental state during the acts due to a defense he relied on, the defense of intoxication. The judge explained to the jury that intoxication could serve as a defense for crimes of specific intent, potentially reducing a charge of murder to manslaughter. The prosecution asserted that this case unequivocally constituted murder. According to their argument, Nadine endured a violent and sustained attack in her own home at the hands of a man familiar to her. The prosecution contended that her ex-partner, fueled by jealous rage, brutally beat and stabbed her. During the court proceedings, it was revealed that in the weeks leading up to Nadine's death, the nature of their messages indicated Daniel's desire for a relationship, while Nadine expressed a clear reluctance. Despite not being in a relationship, Daniel consistently referred to Nadine as his girlfriend and future wife. The prosecutor emphasized this point to the jury, stating, This was coming from his head. Look at the WhatsApp exchanges. They are clear and unequivocal. She makes it clear that she wants nothing more to do with him on that level. Just because they fell for each other in Australia, he somehow thought he had the right to control her life and say who she was to go out with. The court learned that just under two weeks before Nadine's death, she explicitly messaged Daniel, cautioning him not to threaten her and clarifying that nothing is ever going to happen between us again. I want to make that clear. These messages served as evidence of Nadine's unequivocal stance regarding their relationship. In court, Amila provided testimony describing Daniel's condition when she witnessed him assaulting Nadine. She recounted that he had his hands around Nadine's neck and shoulder, 
Claire, Nadine's mother, also testified, expressing her shock at the sight of her own daughter. When Claire arrived, Nadine was unconscious but making gurgling and gasping sounds. Claire sat beside her, reassuring her that they could overcome the situation. Despite administering CPR, Nadine's injuries were so severe that it felt like their efforts were in vain. The court further heard that a police officer drove the ambulance to the hospital, allowing the paramedics to tend to Nadine during the journey. One of the paramedics, Ian Clark, testified that the call would haunt him throughout his career. He described the scene inside Nadine's apartment as if a bulldozer had torn through it, with broken furniture scattered everywhere. Ian expressed that it was one of the most horrendous scenes he had ever encountered, leaving his uniform covered in blood when he departed. Nadine was rushed to the emergency department at the hospital, and the court heard testimony from Nurse, who confirmed that Nadine was unconscious upon arrival. Nurse described Nadine's condition, noting that her head appeared disproportionately large compared to her small body, presumably due to significant swelling around her face. Following her initial treatment, Nadine was transferred to the intensive care unit. Nurse Leah Grant, who works in the ICU, testified in court, expressing the shocking extent of Nadine's injuries. Leah stated that Nadine was completely unrecognizable. She emphasized the severity of the situation by recounting an incident when Nadine's mother brought in a photograph of her. Leah's colleagues were unable to identify the person in the picture, prompting Leah to point to Nadine and say, that's her. The injuries were so severe that there was no apparent resemblance between the woman in the hospital bed and the Nadine in the photograph. Leah testified that the severity of Nadine's injuries made it impossible to check her pupils, especially her right eye, which was so swollen that it couldn't be opened. Within the first 24 hours of being in the hospital, Nadine received an astonishing 42 units of blood. Leah informed the jury that Nadine's hair contained numerous shards of reflective glass, and her nose continued to bleed persistently. The prosecution presented the court with the staggering revelation that there were 64 distinct injuries on Nadine's body that could not be explained by medical intervention. Chief State Pathologist Dr. Linda Mulligan provided testimony regarding Nadine's injuries. Dr. Mulligan conveyed that Nadine's cause of death was attributed to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, resulting from cardiac arrests induced by severe traumatic head and neck injuries. These injuries included a stab wound to the right side of the neck, an incised wound to the left side of the neck, and profound blunt force trauma to the head. Dr. Mulligan clarified that the blunt force injuries were consistent with being caused by hands, fists, or feet, and the possibility of a blunt weapon being used could not be ruled out. The examination revealed a fracture of the hyoid bone and bruising around the neck area, indicative of force being applied to Nadine's neck. Nadine's injuries also included an incised wound on the left side of her neck, extending from the left earlobe to the left side of her neck. Additionally, there was a stab wound to the right side of Nadine's neck, the depth of the stab wound at five centimeters indicated the use of a knife or a knife-shaped object. The court was informed of additional injuries sustained by Nadine, including fractures to the nasal bone, fractures to the lower jaw, and blood oozing from both nostrils. Blunt force trauma resulted in bruising over the right eye and side of the head, severe swelling with lacerations over the left eye, and pulverization of the left-sided facial muscles. Nadine's brain exhibited diffuse swelling, limited in capacity to expand, with damage to nerve cells and discoloration in the brainstem. Dr. Mulligan, summarizing her findings, concluded that the injuries were indicative of a sustained assault involving both blunt and sharp force trauma. Forensic scientist Dr. Stephen Clifford testified that the amount of blood splatter found in the kitchen suggested a sustained assault while Nadine was on the floor there. The prosecution argued that Nadine was attacked not only in the living room, but also in the kitchen. The defense asserted that the violent incident leading to the bloodbath would not have occurred if not for the influence of alcohol and illegal substances consumed by Daniel. In court, Daniel claimed that he and Nadine had reconciled multiple times since their return from Australia 
and were together at the time of her death. According to Daniel, they had been in a relationship for several weeks and planned to share the news with their families during Christmas. Daniel admitted to engaging in substance use in the hours leading up to the incident. He attributed this substance use as the cause of his brutal and violent assault on Nadine. In the closing arguments, the prosecutor implored the jury to render a verdict of guilty of murder, emphasizing the apparent clear intent demonstrated by Daniel's actions. On the other hand, the defense urged the jury to concentrate on the intent aspect, presenting it as the central battleground in the case. They requested the jury to consider the level of intoxication on the night of the incident as a mitigating factor. On August 5, 2021, a jury at the Central Criminal Court unanimously found Murtaugh guilty of murdering Lot, rejecting his defense after nearly six hours of deliberation spanning two days. He was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment on October 4, 2021, as mandated by law. During the sentencing, Claire Lott delivered a victim impact statement, expressing how Lott's family is haunted by Nadine's terror, fear, and panic during the prolonged and evil attack on that fateful night. She highlighted that the family now copes with traumatic counseling instead of hobbies, experiences night terrors and sleepless nights, and witnesses life being replaced with mere existence. Additionally, it was disclosed in the sentencing hearing that Murta had nine prior convictions, including one in 2011 for threatening and abusive behavior. Nadine Lott's funeral service took place on December 22nd at Saints Mary and Peter's Church in Arklow. Nearly 1,000 individuals attended the church ceremony with hundreds more gathered outside. Following the service, she was laid to rest in St. Gabriel's Cemetery. What do you think about this story? Share your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching and for being with me. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.